White tee, jean shorts, and a big 4-4. Four, four. Sitting on my porch, blowing a new port. In the middle of a war, my niggas, we hold court. Flat the course and roll with the appropriate force. When that thing pop off, you hoping it's yours. But you lying on the floor, wondering what they running for. I clear ball courts, bitches crawling on all fours. Nigga, this a chap, what you calling the caps for? Turn a foothill strip to the Gaza Strip. Nigga, chain real thick, then he got a strip. When you see me coming, don't pop no shit. Just pop your shit, cause I'ma pop my shit. Yeah, this is what happens when my money gets low. Uh, sometimes it happens over punk ass hoes. This is what happens when cats stop interacting and start dirty macking and cutting in on my action, make it rain. Yeah. Uh. You feel that? What's up, y'all? This is Peter Agostin. Welcome to my podcast, The House List. I'm back. I'm back in New York. I'm back in Brooklyn. It's hot as fuck here. And uh, I just got back from California, where I spent about a week's time working on this podcast, uh, talking to people, having great conversations with people. Um, I had some work to do as well outside of that. As you know, some of you might know that I run my own booking agency, the Augustine Agency, and I was out there with uh, one of my rock bands, Ivan and the Parazol, who was on the house list. If you scroll back, you can catch our conversation recorded in Budapest. So I was out there for some work, and I stayed a little extra to uh, talk to some old friends and some colleagues and some people and that's some really great conversations in San Diego and Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, the East Bay. And I uh, even saw DJ CJ Stewart, the uh, editor of this show and every show, The House List, which is what you're listening to. And one of those conversations I had is the one that we're about to get into today. Episode 43 of The House List with the one and only Tajay, of course, you may recognize that voice from the intro. Tajay, Souls of Mischief, Hieroglyphics, Oakland, California, which is where we recorded this episode live. And uh, he has a new project called Rap Noir. And the single is what I played at the intro. I'm going to play a little bit more on the outro. It's called Let It Rain. It's out now. You can find it on iTunes under Rap Noir, which is him Tajay, Souls of Mischief, and the producer Unjust. Check it out. There's a concept running in it, and uh, it's dope. I dig it. And I've been a fan of Tajay's since the very beginning of Souls of Mischief uh, as a child of music videos and of college radio. I think Souls of Mischief were uh, immense players in both medium as they like you know entered the music industry for what it's worth. And um, I think a lot of people grew up on Souls of Mischief. And what's uh, awesome and amazing is that they continue to thrive both as solo artists and as a group. And he had just gotten back from a tour in Europe with the, with Souls a few days, really, before uh, since we had that conversation. And I even went on a tour. There was a, a, a period of time when I was touring when I had my label, Female Fun Records, and I did a European tour with Sadat X, Greg Nice of Nice and Smooth, my man Geology. We crisscrossed Europe and had a gang of different shows with Souls of Mischief during that time, and Zion and I uh, all together in these like giant bills. So I look back fondly at that time. That was well over a decade ago. But Tajay is always was the first one up. Uh, working in the morning he's always had multiple things going on a grad student now he's an architect he owns a hotel in panama and we talk a lot about about that stuff we we definitely get into the music but i've always been fascinated with all his other uh you know careers that he's done and he was definitely open to talk about it and and given you know where we 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 linked up he picked me up in lake Merritt in oakland and we drove around a little bit before our conversation. So a lot of the conversation is really reflective of what's going on in, in the East Bay right now, which is obviously in a state of flux, uh, as are many uh, um, places in this country. But I think, you know, reverberating out of Silicon Valley and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, 
perhaps good and bad, but we we dig into it, and he's not one to uh, uh, mince words, if you will. I think that's the right saying. And uh, so I thought it was a really great, intriguing, um, insightful conversation, which I'm looking forward to sharing with you cats in just a moment. If this is your first time listening, though, I want to, I got to pay some bills, pay a little bit of dues, even though I don't make any money doing this. It's a labor of love. I'd love to get to a point where I can do that. But up until then, I want to get the word out on this podcast because it's something I do for the love and trying to talk to people uh, that I admire in the industry um, and just as human beings and artists alone. And you'll see as I share a lot of these episodes from my trip to the West Coast. But if this is your first time listening, check it. You can you can hear the podcast in a couple different ways. It's on iTunes. It's on the Stitcher app. Um, it's on YouTube. Specifically, though, I want to talk about SoundCloud just for a second because I guess it's under threat. And I don't know what Chance the Rapper is going to do. If he saves it, that's awesome because I do think there is a lot of people that specifically listen to this podcast exclusively on SoundCloud. So I want to send a special shout out to those people in particular. I know it's not everybody, but I've seen with some of the hip hop episodes, the hip hop oriented episodes I do, um, there's a higher influx of people listening on SoundCloud. And it's where I can find most of my data as far as where people are listening, who's listening, you know, all that stuff. So if you've been tuning in on SoundCloud, I really appreciate it. You can find it at soundcloud.com backslash the houseless podcast. Take a take a minute to repost it if you got a if you have a page uh, an account um, because who knows how long that this thing's gonna last. It's like I just watched that um, you know Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre uh, melodrama on HBO, and it's like you know I remember when Beats came out. I was like this is a great platform that did not last very long. You know what I'm saying? So SoundCloud, who knows how long it's gonna be around? I know they let they let off hundreds of people. So we'll see. But in the meantime, because I know people listen to it on that medium, get the, let's get the word out as much as we can because it's the most easily postable link that I have to get the podcast out. And since I'm not part of some large infrastructure of, of, of with there's no marketing machine behind the, the podcast. So it's really just word of mouth. So and the cats that listen on SoundCloud are the ones that repost it. And I really appreciate it. So shout out to y'all. Let's keep it going a little bit more. You can find me on Twitter too, which is where I announce the podcast for the most part at houseless pod. So yes, just want to get that out of the way before we get into this great conversation with Tajay recorded in Oakland, California. And, um, what can I say? I have a great relationship with, with California. I had an incredible time when I was out there. Most of the people I know live there. Um, in New York, I'm kind of like a lone wolf because a lot of the people in my circle, in my community have either left or, you know, they're doing their own thing. It's just a different kind of playing field here as far as music and the industry goes. So, uh, going out to California, it's always like a totally different landscape for me. And I lived on the West coast for just under a decade too. It's where I started my record label. It's where I started Culturama. So there's a lot of people that I've worked with and known for many years. And that will be on this podcast in the coming weeks, for sure. And, I mean, Souls of Mischief, in the canon of, of hip-hop, 90s and otherwise, I mean, that they're still active and still inventive, great lyricists, um, always great uh, at produ picking produ uh, producers, I mean, incredible producers, too, A-plus and and Opio are amazing producers too, as far as their music, the Souls of Mischief stuff goes. Some of the greatest stuff was produced in house. So yes, I'm a fan, uh, and I admire those dudes. And Tajay's always been super dope to me, so uh, I definitely appreciate his time. So without further ado, um, let's get into my conversation with the one and only Tajay, Souls of Mischief, Hieroglyphics, Rap Noir, the new project. Peep it out on iTunes right now only here on the house list. Let's go. Um, so yeah, and basically, uh, I'm just going to be like, you know, I say a couple words and kind of keep it to you. I mean, you project pretty well already when you're talking anyway, mm -hmm. so I mean, it's going to... Trying to say I'm loud, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm hard of hearing you. Too much rapping. Um, so yeah, I was trying to think of, you know, obviously a, a starting point, um, but since I haven't seen you in a while too, and I know that you've been doing a lot of other 
stuff um, beyond music instead of you know trying to begin with any kind of musical um, uh, conversation I'd just love to know like what you've been up to because you have like multiple businesses sort of working right now and I think it sort of plays into a larger story of your career because you always I remember when you you went back to school you went back to college too in the middle of uh, you know the height of souls and mischief too so Mm -hmm. I just love to hear first like what you have going on because I I've noticed that there's like this design company or it's an architecture mm-hmm. company, right? Mm-hmm. So what's the origin story with that? Because that's been a few years in the making for sure, right? Yeah, I think honestly, looking back, I've always wanted to be an architect. Really? And I, you know, I like Legos, Tetris. Right. I like to pack clothes. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I know it sounds weird, but you know, organizational stuff. And it became something where I think. I did some shows with some old school cats, uh-huh. and I really wasn't like I was like, damn, these dudes are in their fifties, still kind of on this circuit, you know? Right. And I mean, you're doing what you love. It's not to knock them and all that. Sure. But I just seen them really do some funny money stuff. Where I'm like, I'm not about to be trying to put somebody in a headlock for two hundred dollars, extra dollars, right? You right. know? So at at fifty, you know, like it just right. doesn't seem. And then I also saw the movie The Wrestler. Have you yeah. ever seen that movie? Yeah, definitely. So that movie, those two Would things. Make yeah, it would make yes. you work. Exactly. Those two things, my lifelong love for design, and then um, really having the opportunity being independent uh-huh. so that I can control my time and stuff like that. Well, I'm that like, has always been like a thing with hieroglyphics anyway, too, with the website and with putting records out, app like post-distribution, uh, kind of controlling the distribution, right? So that's been a constant for you anyway. I think, yeah. Right? yeah, so we weren't at, at the mercy of some sort of corporation telling us right. when and where we had to be somewhere. Right. So with that autonomy, I think it made it possible for me to go back to school. I mean, only I went to Berkeley. I had a family, so I went to Berkeley because I couldn't relocate to go to school, but yeah. I'm really happy I went there. I graduated in 2014 from uh, with a master's in architecture, and I've been designing for a company called Sabi Design Build and another one called uh, Beaumont & Associates. So Stanford. what's like... Um what are those jobs like? I mean, my frame of reference for architecture is really homes. Mm-hmm. You know, I have like some, like I love John Lautner and stuff like oh, that. You know, cool. these kind of like sort of 50s and 60s California, the stuff Great on the period. hills. Yeah, Great period. yeah, beautiful, you know, kind of space age design in yeah. the 60s or whatever. Yeah. But so this is all types of stuff, commercial and residential or how does it? Commercial and residential. Um, my first job was actually um, a cupcake shop for Casual's little sister. Uh, really? Yeah, mm-hmm. in, in Berkeley. So she gave me a job right when I was when I was still at uh, my final year of school. So I do restaurants. I've done like a Red Bay coffee out here. I'm doing a uh, catering spot up in Antioch. So I, I, the stuff that comes to me a lot of times is sort of small restaurant or small Mm, how can I say that? Bakery type spots, and then a lot of residential. I haven't done any um, commercial like uh, I haven't done any high rises. The highest we probably right. go is five, five, five stories. Oh, I mean, wow. they'll be Let's retail in the front, right? And then what apartments above? Apartments above or apartments on the same level. And then we for a while, you know, we're in a huge building period in Oakland right now. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. So a while it was just like rehabbing, like getting places okay. and either turning these old factories into lofts. One of our mm-hmm. lofts got like top seven places to live in America, which is a weird number, but right. one of the one of the top seven. And then um, so repurposing these old factories and buildings to do sort of loft living. And Did you, also, Is that something that you like, do you have a handle on that? Because that's got to be a uh, an industry and I guess in a way art in itself is like re... Um, uh, formatting a build an old building that might or bringing it back up to code or something like that, right? The the fortunately the client that I work for during for those builds was a contractor and sort of develop contractor slash developer. Right. So he knew all kind of not and I when I say shortcuts I don't mean with regard to quality and things. Sure. But like he would say, hey, I'm buying a brick building because I can shore it up this way. Mm-hmm. I'm gutting it completely because I don't want to have to deal with rot or any of these type of things. Yeah. Then once you gut it completely, now let's let's cut it up into these proper ways and I think to a, to a large extent we're doing lofts so not a lot of walls it's like open plan right, right. you know so but I mean he was killing you know I think he's I don't know if he's moved on or if he's selling the majority of his projects now but there's still money in that but a lot of those industrial places now have been converted mm-hmm. and so now I'm doing a lot more new construction I mean I just did two Victorians over in West three Victorians in West Oakland um 
I'm doing a brand new house up Skyline. That's where I was coming from with my uh, design partner right. today. So, and that's modern, like super modern, good contemporary, or whatever. So, what's the? I mean, I, how do you go about even doing that? Drawing a plan or the blueprints or what is that like? It, I, I, it's you know, it's like making beats. Yeah. Really, you know, it's not like rapping because the performance is only really pitching to the client. Right. And we really don't, you know, most work in this stuff is word of mouth. So we don't really have to pitch mm-hmm. our designs. It's more like making a beat and then people coming at you. I guess when you get to a certain level, they want a certain type of beat from you. I'd say like Primo. Right. Primo right. probably has all kind of beats. Sure. Everybody wants to beat chops with the cuts. Yeah. The same thing. And that's kind of what I see in this industry too. You get yeah, known you for that. a couple of styles of building mm-hmm. and then people are like, I want one of those, but this way. And it's like, mm-hmm. all right, okay. This site is completely different. Right. The climate is completely different. Right. The time, the period I'm making is completely different. The local materials are different, but hey, you want one of these? I'll, here, I'll yeah. give you the same beat. If the, you know, but it, it, you, you draw, you go visit the site, you, you talk to the client and see what their style is with regard to you know, they want modern, do they want contemporary, do they want, you know, some old school stuff. In Oakland, there's a sort of historical period uh, areas, and so you have to do Victorians and things of that nature right. and keep in tune with the with the historical style of the areas. But um, then it's all about freaking the insides because right. the outsides can look, you know, the same thing. But it, it's it's really, you, you go, you measure the site, you draw, and you go back and forth with both the, the, the client and the city with regard to the parameters of the design and everything, eventually it gets approved, and then, and then you give the drawings to a contractor who sort of reads sure. it like a map right. um, and, and, and actually builds it. So I would say, it's it, to keep on using the production metaphor, it's almost like I'm beatboxing some shit, or right. I give them the skeleton, yeah. and then I hand it to an engineer to, to t- bust it all out right. and tweak everything, yeah. and they really build. Now, I work for a design build firm, so we do build our own stuff, but... I haven't had much. I've had to manage a couple projects as far as construction management, but my boss is more deal with that. That's straight. Like this is like uh, like a Monday through Friday, like a real nine to five type of thing, right? Are you? Is it like music where you're just kind of on call? Like, are you working on it constantly? Or if I was more disciplined, I'd probably be working on it constantly. Yeah. But because I have all these other businesses, right? right, right. But my bosses understand. I work for a small firm. It's two other, either two principals above me, and then I've got me and two other draftsmen and then one guy who does all the energy work so oh, right, I mean yeah. I mean, but it's cool man I work for some Jamaican cats one of them used to be a musician the other guy is in the you know we play grime shit you know he, he was living in the UK for a while He's so they young. get it yeah, yeah yeah like I just came off tour for three weeks right but I was in the hotel doing work too you know right, right, which right. is the same as when I was in college doing work when 93 Till was out and all that and right stuff. right yeah because how did that work I mean you were doing Schoolwork and getting it to and turned in somehow like correspondent style, right? Like, Fax machine. So I had a homegirl, yes. Sharifa, Sharifa Abdullah. She used to help me out and she would uh, get my faxes and turn them into my professors. But even with that, I probably ended up going to class more than the people who were there because nobody goes to class. Right? <laughs> right. And I was paying for it. So I was like, look, I had broken it down. Every class was $139. When I broke down the cost of tuition yeah. and everything, I right. was like, so if I don't go, I wasted 139 bucks. Right. Well, that's a great way to look at it. Then it makes it a lot more tangible to get it done, mm-hmm. especially when you're moving around. This was undergrad, right? Undergrad. That was- Grad school, I, I took time. I, architecture school, they want 16 hours of you. Right. And then I was probably the oldest guy in my um, class. And I'm the only guy, maybe there's maybe one or two foreign students who have families. But because they're foreign students and the family structure is different, it'd be like, yo, my wife is at the house with the kids. She, I'm sleeping. I'm going to sleep at my desk and, wow. and knock it out. You know, right. U.S. is a little different family structure. It's like, where are you? Like, I'm just doing work. Hey, there's work to do here. Right. Get home. Yeah. So, how, so going back to, to just this building and knowing that uh, in a way, I guess, Oakland is, uh, and maybe it's the, the whole Obviously, there's different facets of the whole greater Bay Area because mm-hmm. of what's happened in San Francisco. And mm-hmm. um, like, how do you, how are you seeing that just um, on a builder level? As you, because obviously you're dealing with contractors, and mm-hmm. that's a that's the other side of the fence from design. Mm-hmm. So like, and I think there's a, it's like a hot button kind of area in the country because of startups and Silicon Valley. It's and the that, hottest and, area, really. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy because I think that there's a housing shortage. Okay. But but what's all being built is what we call market rate, and market okay. rate is not affordable for 
somebody who's not making six figures, maybe a couple who both aren't making six figures, which is yeah. a lot of people, obviously. Well, probably most, most people, right? right? Maybe not, you know, maybe most people. Yeah. And so, as we were talking about in the car earlier, I mean, if the working professional who isn't making six figures and who's, who doesn't have a spouse that's making the same can't afford a house, then you know the people who are the most vulnerable can't. And that's how we have all these pop up uh, cities, tent cities, and, and yeah, it, definitely. It, I, I, like, so it's 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 good. I mean, look, I'm, I'm fortunate to fall on the right side of the coin or whatever with regard to I'm in an industry where people are paying me to develop these things, mm-hmm. and so that's good. However, I am seeing the negative side, which is a lot of those old buildings that people are clearing out were like, what is it called, uh, SRO, single residency, uh-huh. single resi- yeah. you know, hotels and things like that. So there's there's a lot of housing services that also may have had a mental health component. Or also uh-huh. may have had a government assistance component, or yeah. you know that they're falling apart. Then I'm also seeing a lot of people who are moving to Oakland because there's shanty towns and stuff like that, and it's good weather and it's nice, and you can beg and get a cool amount of money. Yeah, you can get by just on that alone. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but I'm also seeing kids move out here from like Michigan and Ohio and stuff. They're like now, I don't know if they were on heroin before they came, but they are now, mm. and you know, like I'm seeing that too. But they. It's, it's a very weird time. I've right. never seen this many shanties. I've never seen this many homeless people per capita. Part of it is in San Francisco, they push them all over here as well. Right. You know, so it's it's tough, but I think it's making people, at least since they're bringing it to your doorstep almost literally, it's making people start to think about class in America, about um, taking care of the least protected parts of society, or what are we going to do with these people, and these people would be in a quote, quotation because... When you look at any family that's, you know, we're an immigrant country, everybody's what, maybe two generations out of poverty max, mm-hmm. you know, out of, out of, I got off, I got off the boat with yeah. nothing, yeah. you know? So at some point, somebody in your family or somebody you knew or grew up with or something is one of these people who's living in one of these tents. So maybe we'll show some sort of compassion and empathy for these people. I mean, as, as an, a property owner here, it's frustrating to, when I walk outside of my property and there's a new mattress and there's new human feces and there's new really I mean, yeah it's like that oh yeah. man it's nuts and then also people are dumping trash everywhere in Oakland because there's already trash okay. and I think that some people are even getting a moral justification of it saying well hey somebody could use this as a chair it's a bed etc but nah you just illegally dump it, dump it on the street and right. add it to the problem right 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 and, and, and they do these massive cleanups and two or three days later, same amount of trash, if not more. Really? And it's not, I mean, think about it. Are poor people dumping jacuzzi tubs on the street? <laughs> Are poor people, like, can they afford to get rid of a mattress set? Right. Like, no. Like, you know, or a whole dining set or... Right. And even, I mean, if you're living in a tent, then you also don't have use for that. Yeah. So, so why are you dumping, dumping mattresses across right. from these guys in these tents? Right. You know, right. so there's this... Mm. this uh, I guess symbiotic, negative symbiotic relationship right. between sort of the haves who have too much and are upgrading their places and are, uh, uh, you know, yeah. adding on, taking their garbage instead of the, they don't have enough, they feel they don't have enough to pay the proper disposal ways to do it. So mm-hmm. they're coming over and dumping in Oakland. And I, and I don't think it's just Oakland residents. I know for a fact it's really? not Oakland. I think uh, contractors, restaurant owners, just regular citizens come, hop off the freeway from wherever they come, through the tunnel, the Concords, the Walnut Creeks, Interesting. Leandro, and, and come dump in Oakland. Right. And, and if you go to San Leandro, first city over. Yeah. If you go to Berkeley, first city over. Right. You don't see it at. Really? So how come, so how, what do you think it's just Oakland people are dirty? Oakland, the place with the highest retail value, you know, uh, real estate property values, you know, where, you know, median home values like six hundred thousand. you know, like yeah, yeah. they're just dirty, nasty people who want to, who want garbage all over the street. Mm. No, nah, it's people coming from all over and dumping here. And that, and that's, a, that's frustrating to me, but I don't, I don't know the solution except if it's punitive. And I, you know, as like my kids go to school in East Oakland, they dump there every day, every really? single day, by the school, every single man, every single day. It's also a heroin spot by the school too. Damn. So they're leaving armchairs out there, guys, and shoot up in. But yeah. every single day, we went to get a camera system that would be able to recognize um, license plates and all that. And okay. It was $30,000 for the camera system, plus monitoring, to go to the city. Right. And then when that happens, they still don't do anything but issue a ticket. 
There's right. not. There's no criminal. And that doesn't really do anything at it all. It does nothing because right. first of all, the people who are doing the dumping probably can afford to pay it. Sure. Or or they just never. They've they've. I think there's like two or three million dollars in fines that they've sent out, mm-hmm. and I think they've collected maybe seventy grand or something like that. Wow. Because there's no. There's no recourse. I'm like, if you catch somebody, I mean, I've caught people dumping and, and pulled out burrs. You know, like, yo, wow. don't do that over here, bro. Sure. You know, but if you catch somebody dumping, there's no recourse. You get a slap on the wrist. I would say impound their vehicle right there. Sure, okay, you yeah. want to dump on the streets? Here, we're taking the car. To, now, leave that with us. Right, right, I bet right. you it would stop quickly. Yeah, definitely. You know? But yeah. but I, I don't understand the, the administration's response towards it. Because this is new, too. I mean, the dumping's been going on a while. But the shantytown thing is like two, three years. Wow. What about that? Uh, the fire uh, and the... The fires. The fires. Because there's one, there was one a couple of days ago, right? Yeah. That was like a high rise, a new prefab but, but, high rise. But right? three or four of those have gone down. Really? One of them went down twice. So twice really, from the same location? Same location. And wow. it's burning the houses next to it, too. Oh, wow. So at first I was, you know, it happens once. I think it's unscrupulous land, landlords trying, well, when it happens to a place that's inhabited or with, with, uh, with residents and, and the resident uh, rents are underperforming, mm-hmm. I think it's the landlord. Dude, it's arson. Yeah, it's, 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 no, it's all arson. It's all arson. Okay. It's all arson. Right. I mean, then, you know, accidental fires over here happening at all. Hmm. How how are you going to accidentally burn down a construction site? Well, you, yeah, you were the yeah, security guard and you're smoking a cigarette yeah. and you tossed it. You know that's the first thing they probably tell you. Don't do that. So it wasn't sure. you, and you don't right. want to lose your job. Right. right it's right. arson. But now, who is the culprit of the arson? I think some of it might be a uh, a radical anti gentrification firebug, and okay. some of it might be um, developers who are who are either in over their head and want to get this insurance money. Mm, or yeah. or um, don't feel like finishing the projects. I don't know, but I mean, there's I've seen one place burn down twice. There's pushback around here too, obviously, right? A lot of it, yeah. Yeah, but the pushback is is it, it's coming from like the wrong side, or is it? I I can't explain it. It's right. the pushback for the powerless is not to go burn shit down because mm-hmm. they want housing. Yeah. So the hope is eventually that that housing will a portion of it will be lower income. But they're not going to burn it down and risk their neighbor. They live there in these right. places. They're not right. going to burn out. So to me, and this is going to go way out to come back in, when I look at U.S. Antifa, when I look at Black Bloc and all these kind of things, I think we have a group of people who don't have to worry about the consequences of their very radical actions mm-hmm. in areas that they don't live in, they don't work in, they don't visit. They come, they wrap themselves up, they do some shit like burn something down. Because fuck the system and fuck and right. fuck gentrification, or they do some shit like break every window somewhere, and, and and then they go back to wherever they're from, where the police presence isn't increased because of that, but it's increased in the hood now. Yeah, you know, all in, any protest looks like a riot now. You know, mm. and see, so so I there's some misplaced. Uh, I, I think that people's hearts are in the right place, but I think everybody on earth, except for bad people. Wants everybody to be fed, clothed, housed, educated, absolutely, and and and, 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 and cared for health wise. Yeah. I, I don't even think the guys who are cutting health care don't want it. They right. just don't want to pay for it, and they right. want they want their taxes to go to their pockets, right, right, right. or or war. I guess worldwide, worldwide endless war. Right. So I don't, you know. So there's a base human thing that I think everybody's operating out of, but I think sometimes some of the more radical factions on right and left have weird ass ways of going about doing this and I think burning down construction sites endangers human beings so it's going against even if you're saying this is wrong this is anti-human we're not making housing for everyone we're only making housing for a certain group you're burning you're sending carbon emissions into the air yeah you know what I'm you, you, you're, you're creating a now it's a double work cycle because they're just going to remake it. they're not going to stop anything right they're not stopping anything you're, you're right. creating increased insurance premium so the insurance fat cats you know like you're not there's the 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 um the result of your actions is not your end goal and mm-hmm. I, and that's that's confusing all over like you know like if we're going to burn everything down let's burn everything down but let's not just target certain things and feel smug and and sure uh, about that cuz i doubt it somebody who even lives in that area like i'm not, i'm saying it's not some guy who's like i grew up playing in this park right. now they're going to knock it down and make a high rise yeah. i'm gonna burn that thing down <laughs> no like right. Hood fools don't think like that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying the hood is a monolith, but cats ain't like I'm gonna endanger my life, endanger my course, freedom yeah, to a make a point, point about gentrification. Right. That's like some, like when you see after these quote unquote riots and protests, 
capitalist pigs go home and uh, and the windows on the Starbucks and the uh, be of air broken right that's not hood cats like fighting police brutality or fighting you know what I'm saying or even it's fighting that are fighting. coming in it's fools that are coming in right. who, are, who, are, who are like I'm anti this and I'm anti that it's a philosophical fight that they're fighting but it has real results that that uh, adversely affect poor people and since poor skews colored in America mm-hmm. colored people you know what I mean but I think a so lot of these might have a more of an adverse effect more. than anything right? not actually definitely yeah definitely I mean look at when Occupy Wall Street was going down yeah. what cumulative change has happened since then nothing in fact yeah. it's gone more strict more surveillance more draconian right. more police money etc so did they did they did they get anybody's debt absolved did they, you know, did they free any political prisoners? Is there more housing available for, for people, you know? Like, I don't, but, you know, I'm also 42. I've also had a relative level of success in life. I've traveled the world. My family is taken care of. So maybe I have a bourgeois perspective. How, but, but, but when I look at the real hard reality of the responses to these actions, it's never, it's not, it's not increased safety, health, Happiness, liberty, any of that for the people who they say that they're looking out for, which is the little guy or those people who aren't, are, are the least protected and most vulnerable right. under this system. So having just come back from Europe, from touring overseas, you know, obviously you you always pick up uh, a bunch of, of, you know, people's opinions and especially at a rap show, especially for Souls of Mischief who have a long history overseas too. So I'm sure, and people know that you're uh, you know, politically minded, so I'm sure you have people coming up to you to show, trying to express their, uh, you know, what, like their reactionary kind of feelings towards like, you know, obviously Trump and what's going on here and, and then what's, the, what's that like? Is, if that's, I don't know if that's an accurate kind of no. assessment or what? It went from when we first started traveling the world, people being like, I want to hop in your suitcase with you. I love America. Yeah. You know, and I guess that's Clinton... Clinton years or whatever, sure. to when Bush got an off, like fools be acting like Bush wasn't the worst president we ever had in the history of mankind. He was so bad, in fact, a black guy got elected next. <laughs> Come on, let's keep it real. Right. He was so terrible, so, the worst ever, that a black dude got elected next. Now, all of a sudden, uh, Obama's the bad guy and all that kind of, so people used to be like, let me hop in your suitcase, go back. Then when Bush got elected... We'd have to tell people we were Canadians overseas. We don't get our food spit in. I don't want to have a long ass political debate. I didn't vote for that. I'm a black dude. I'm not even down with this system or none of this at all. Like, but it used to be visibly, we know it's not y'all, but what's going on? Yeah. But then when you start looking at the Bush era and all that kind of stuff, and even the Obama era, Obama, I say, helped our esteem worldwide because it seemed like we were being more global minded and, and open minded. However, if we're bombing the shit out of everybody, we're droning everybody. We're creating all kinds of terror that never makes it here. Right. It only affects the closest stuff out there. Right, right, People right. are still looking. And then also when you look at the, the turn that rap made. So we went from, you know, black medallions, uh, you know, no gold to platinum and, and platinum teeth. Yeah. Platinum teeth with diamonds. Right. That doesn't even sound like a. That sounds like a ghost face line, right? That's yes. a real thing. That's like very platinum real teeth thing. with diamonds. And it's not just fronts; it's individual teeth. Yeah. I mean, it's so real, right? Now. So then people will start looking at like it is y'all too. Unfortunately, wow. this is the only thing that we export. Is this sort of I mean, hip hop or entertainment culture? So they don't look mm-hmm. at it like most guys. They're like if we put a room full of black guys. 87% of them wouldn't have any sort of gold teeth whatever, whatsoever. And then of the guys with gold teeth, how many of them have platinum teeth? And then how many of them have platinum teeth with diamonds? It's a super small subset of like yeah. 10 people, you know? Right, right, right. But that's the marketing that's overseas. So then it's like, and y'all are just as bad as everybody else. And especially from Africans, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. who are all trying, you know, they're trying to come up. No. I mean, they, they're looking at America as an opportunity. They're like, how sure. are y'all squandering your opportunities on Bugattis and platinum teeth? Like, what's well, going yeah, on? That, yeah, that's a whole other argument, too. Yeah, yeah where their perspective is how like what's, we're taking it all for granted. Yeah, yeah. Abusing you it have so. all these opportunities, and right. this is what you're doing. You're not, you know, you can be a doctor, and you're not going to be a doctor. You're going to drive, right. you know, you're going to get this help. You're going to get a face tattoo instead. Right. You know, you're t- black China, you know, like, yeah. all this yeah. stuff. So, it's changed completely, right? But not, so, I mean, we have to remember George Bush was our president for eight years. Started a war 
over some BS. Right. You know what I'm saying? People are so, forgetting so that quickly. Too. And it's so weird because I'm like, Trump, and then on top of that, we were talking about this in the car. Well, let's talk about the, the, our, my travels. So right. then in my travels, it's since Bush has been in office, it's been like, yo, I'm Canadian. Right. You know, like, unless the people know who I am. Sure. And then this past trip, which is probably our first one post-Trump, I mean, that was the only thing people want to talk about. And then I have oh, to explain, definitely. like, the electoral college system. Like, actually, the majority of people didn't even vote for the guy. Right. You right. know, you, you, have, you have to explain right. that. Right. So, so you could, I mean, and also people have this view of Americans. Y'all are fat. Y'all are ignorant. Y'all are loud. Y'all right. are, y'all are bores, basically. And right. Right. that's cool. You know, we can also say y'all are snobby. You stink. Your teeth are bad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, y'all are imperialists. And you act like. Yeah. We're, you know, we do all the dirty work, but y'all are just as imperial. You know, there's no such thing as British tea. There's no tea growing in Britain. Right, right, there's right. no chocolate growing in, in uh, Holland for there to be Dutch chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Or point. Swiss chocolate. There's no sure. cacao beans. Right, right. That's straight rape money. You right, know what I mean? Right. Like you go to the Rijksmuseum and all these great museums. Like I've been to Egypt and I've been to the Louvre and I've been to the Royal, uh, you know, the Royal Museum. Yeah. Everything from Egypt is in the Louvre. And the British Royal Museum. Nothing is in the pyramids. Right, right. Even the things that are in the pyramids are replicas. It says it. Like, you know, the actual really? thing is in Britain at this. Wow. So they they kind of have this position like you all are so backwards and you 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 still imperial you know, you guys are starting wars everywhere. But I'm like, y'all all are participating. It's all you're all in cahoots. So we have these conversations about Trump a lot, et cetera, and I've got to explain to them, like, yo, the majority of Americans don't even follow or pr- but you know, aren't even down with any of this stuff. I'm, sure. I'm from California. Like, you know, we're our own country almost. We're almost the opposite. Of, Absolutely. But, but then also, it's more nuanced than that, too. You get outside the inner city and you're in America. Oh, yeah. You know, in I got a Stockton or yeah. even Concord or something like that. I'm sure. in a triple K America. I'm not no in question. just. So it's nuanced. And I think yeah. that that was what I ended up explaining to everybody this last time. Mm-hmm. However, when you have an idiot who's not even a successful businessman, Right. You know, he's not even good at what he purports to be. He's definitely not a billionaire. He would have shown his taxes. Right, of course. You know, a, a robber baron who's been laundering money for Russian oligarchs and, and thieves right, right. for the past whatever, how many years, through, his, through, his, through Deutsche Bank and through his mm-hmm. towers, etc. As the, as the highest standard of human being that we're putting out, because we don't have a pope. We don't have a king. Yeah. We have the president. Yeah. And, we, you know, we're politicians, but the president, who's supposed to be the pinnacle? When our pinnacle is such a loser, it there's, there's no ground for us to really stand on. Right. Because I could understand if he had, you know, oh, there was that one scandal. Or, oh, this guy, some of the things he says is problematic. This is the worst dude. This is the dude I'll smack the shit out of in real life. Right. You see what I'm saying, though? Like, uh, let's go somewhere else because I'm end up smacking this guy. Right. You know, like, I wouldn't even want to eat dinner next to him in a <laughs> restaurant. Of course. You know, he's going to be loud. He's going to have people around him. He's going to be speaking and, and saying things. So if that's the pinnacle of what we put forth as leadership, we have no ground to stand. I can't even really argue. So I have to just explain that it's nuanced. It's not as serious. It's not as uh, simple as everybody thinks. Yeah. The electoral college system. I mean, but then it makes you look deeper into it, and it's like, why is why is it how it is? And it, 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 it America is kind of it's a big trap. And then also, if I'm driving down the street, this would really trip me out. I ain't no okay. shanty towns in any of these other places. Right. You know, so I went all over Europe. Shit was clean. If there was even the graffiti was organized or, or, or right. orderly, sure, the sure. ground wasn't dirty just where the graffiti is. Right, right. Where, I, where we're at, the places where the, all the graffiti is, there's probably human waste on the ground too. Yeah, definitely. And stuff. But it's, it's so deep because I'm like, they also don't spend 55% of their money on imperialism. So they have street sweepers that work 24 hours a day, every mm-hmm. day on every street. Right, right. You know what I mean, though? They have anti-abatement, you know, graffiti abatement people that work every day. They have programs for kids where they have areas where you can do graffiti. Mm-hmm. They have money for homeless shelters. They've got, you know, we went to some places where they're paying people just the wage just to exist, which is really, when we're moving forward, when we talk about mechanization and all that kind of stuff, that's really the direction that we're all as humans moving into. So but we're fighting that because of this individualism and socialism is such a dirty word, even though we are... Socialist with regard to all the businesses, the big businesses here right, right, with right. these bailouts and stuff. It's, it's just, yeah. I mean, I kind of got to agree with them. Americans is pretty dumb, too. You know, when we got guys voting against their own health care. Yes. Cl- during Clinton, the hot button was welfare, right? Right. During Clinton, the, more than 60% of people on welfare were white. 
all them people were voting to cut their own services. Right, right. Because the visual representation of welfare is fat black lady, fat Latina, 30 kids, etc. Right. When you combine all groups that are non-white on welfare or poor in poverty, it's still less mm -hmm. than just mm -hmm. white people. And so it's the same thing now. We got guys voting against health care. Right. We got guys talking about small government. And all these people are in states that use the most government services. Sure. It, it, it's, it's a complete, it's like a racism bizarro hat. <laughs> I don't know that makes people see the opposite of reality. Yeah. And I, I, it, it's frustrating because I think that, like I said, I think there's a basic human level of decency that we all feel everybody should be afforded. Of Even course. the most jaded of people are like, I hate niggers. I can't stand these fucking devils. They're still like, I don't hate their kids, though. They're <laughs> well, children. I want sure. the kids to be safe. I, just like I want, yeah. my, I want our kids to play together. You know? Yeah, it's a human you know, emotion that's like internal. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think they all want similar outcomes, but we're able to be manipulated by, by those in power. And we're not, it's getting worse and more insular instead of coming together. You know, like, even the um, police shooting black people at an alarming rate. Yeah. Right? Yes. But they're shooting everybody at an alarming rate. So instead of it being like, look, our cops shouldn't even be killing us. It's like, you're killing us particularly, and they are. However, they're Absolutely. also killing, when you look at the sheer numbers, they're killing yeah. more white people than they are blacks. It's just um, skewed by percentage of population. So, right. so I can, you can say, yeah, there is some racist stuff going on. But there, uh, the meta problem is overzealous, scared police over equipped with military surplus gear undoubtedly yeah. that that are that are scared of the citizenry instead of being there as public servants right. and instead of us rallying behind all of us poor poor people people of color right. uh people who've been victims of police violence and corruptions instead of coming together we split it up into these factions who are then fighting each other yeah you and know? not to sound like an ageist too but when like you know, you have a 21-year-old police officer with a very, like, maybe skewed frame of reference of, of uh, or this being displaced to smaller communities, too. Because um, I see it in New York all the time, like, young guys, mm -hmm. you know, um, that may just be ill-prepared for, for things like that. But it's an For easy everything, let alone things like that. You look at our school yeah. system, et cetera. Sure, and then absolutely. they're not taking the, the, the sharpest pencils and making them cops. You know, no. the sharpest pencils go to law school or whatever, right. right? These guys are just like, hey, be some meat that is a, a buffer between chaos <laughs> and whatever rich people want. You know? Yeah. So I get it. I just, I don't understand how the rest of the world when we talk about the developed world, doesn't have these uniquely American problems. Right. And, and, and we have all these resources and we're squandering them on a worldwide, like a global war campaign that I guess is really working for us because it's keeping us running, but mm -hmm. it's not sustainable. When there's nobody left to kill, we're going to have to hire somebody and create some jobs, create some businesses. Right. You know, when, they're, and when they're, not even nobody left to kill. Nobody left to create this illusion of preparedness and protection from. Exactly. And that might be never. You can always say there's some terrorist group. I mean, look at ISIS. ISIS didn't exist when Al-Qaeda yeah. existed. Al-Qaeda didn't exist when the Mujahideen existed. Mujahideen didn't exist when we were worried about Mao and the KGB and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so that concept continues it, to thrive. So, so that's what I mean. So you can always create this sort of terror thing. Right. I mean, and even with here with the gated communities, inner city terror, yeah. all that kind of stuff, it's always possible to create this sort of specter of danger that we can then use our industrial complex to create products and jobs to thwart. Right. So, so I mean, how do you uh, even stay, like, um, interested in creating any kind of music in the sense of all that shit? Because, I, mean, I mean, I know it's kind of a, a it's a hard right as far as change, mm -hmm. as far as the top, what we're talking no, about. No, yeah, but I get it, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you're still, I mean, since you just got a, you just did a tour, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have, like, another career you have a couple of other non-music things that are a big part of your life too and have a family but like you're still have some you're still act, somewhat active too yeah right? well my new album's called rap noir okay so it's like hitchcock sort of murder stories pimping really? drug dealing you know what i mean but that's kind of uh it's it's you know, it's like making an action movie instead of making a art art house flick, right? Right, right, right. But it was more like brought out by the beats and brought out by the stuff I'm seeing. Like, we're as Hyrule, like, we, our building is a cat of corners from heroin spot. You know, like, it's sure. in deep East Oakland and, 
area that some people would consider dangerous. I feel like it's the safest area, period, because nobody bothers you because they're doing their own thing. Right, but, right. but I they're preoccupied. So, but you see stuff, and you you know, I grow up around. You know, I got homies doing life. I got you know, I'm I'm putting. I got a book out by my buddy who's been wrongly uh, in prison. You know, and 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 they try to give him seventy two to life. They just dropped off fourteen years from his thing because he didn't do what they know. Really? He's basically being somebody shot at him, missed him, killed somebody, and they tried the guy who shot at him and him together. Wow. And put them both 72 to life. Wow. Which is crazy because it's yeah. just like, you know this bullet didn't come from my gun. You know that if I had, if, you know, it was a shootout, but you know if I had, if I had not have shot this guy, that I'd be dead. Right. However, you're going to put us both in jail for this long amount of time. So I'm putting out books by him. because what yeah, what, So what's the story with that? I mean, I've got the, the first book is called A Day in the Life of a Hustler. Second one is called Swapping Places. And so, I mean, he's, he's just a smart dude. Has he the has, first one come out? It's out right now. Cool. So, it's, you know, you can get it off Amazon and Kindle and really? all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, it's, selling books is difficult. That's like yeah. selling broccoli or something. <laughs> you know, like you could probably sell more kale than books right, around, right, right. Right, right now. You know, books aren't. But, but I'm just trying to use all my sort of outlets and use all these technologies to, to really uh, increase my creative output. So making sure. music is not a big deal to me. I, right. I just want to make, like I dropped this rap noir album and I was sitting around with my homies and I was just like, damn, all these beats make me think of crime and vice and stuff like that. So maybe I do need to clear my head of all that's going mm-hmm, on mm-hmm. and sort of tur- turn the corner with regard to what I'm intaking so my output can be a little bit more positive, right. but it doesn't like rap is therapy. So it, the, the, making music's not stopping. It's just where my subject matter has been a little bit more seedy right. because of what I'm seeing going on around me. But that's Cause, cause that, this, that, that, this project too is the, the basically the last album was power movement, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I came out with a mixtape in between, right, and uh, I, the superstars record, but that was done in 2000, and also. Um, this album called Nun Type. I don't know if that was no, that might have been. Oh, that was before. The, I think that was before that was Power Moment. Was stinky, was right? stinky. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but mainly, I mean, mainly Souls of Mischief Records. Sure. So two of those. Um, what is it called? Uh, Hyro Records, of course. All that in between, and then just living life. Yeah. So Power Movement was more like okay. When I make projects, I get in, it's immersive. Sure. So Power Movement was like. G.I. Joe revolutionary kind of gorilla, right. but with the imagery, with the style yeah. of music, everything. And talking about, I mean, that is a, that's a, a Bush era record too. Yeah, that yeah. Out during that period of yeah. time, if you look back. Yeah. And so this is more like, I mean, I finished Rap Noir a little while ago, but it's just, like I'd be in some wild environments. I think if people think that it's, people have this sort of cutting, uh, singular view of life in general and in a black life in general. But like I said, like, my partner that's doing life is a prolific writer. His kid is an actual real genius doing like college level equations at six. Wow. You know what I mean though? Right. From the hood, gets in shootout. You see what I'm saying though? Like yeah. there, there, there's all these different dimensions that go on. So I'm around like some wild stuff. And so I was like, you know what? Let me narrate some of this stuff so people can get an understanding of what goes on around here. Right, right. You know, so. Well, I think, so. I mean, I, I would like to think that Souls of Mischief sort of as a group, too, sort of embodies that, too, where... I, I would hope, but mean. some people, for some reason, we've just been turning... First of all, backpack rap came out after we came out. Like, oh, we, there sure. was no such thing as backpack rap. No. You know what I mean? Like, that that splinter off, and it really came around the time we came out, because uh, it was more... Like, Black Moon had the backpacks. There was right. Rough House Survivors, check my backpack. Right. But that was more like a New York, I'm on the go. You might have a gun and a 40 in your backpack. Yeah. It wasn't like, this is hip-hop and this is rap. Or yeah. this is funny style and this is street style. Right, right, right. So we've always tried to embody that because like, we're just normal dudes from Oakland, but Oakland is wild. And I think this is in that vein. I don't think it's any darker than, say, anything can happen or mm-hmm. you know any of these other stories that we tell. Right. However, I just went with it this time. You know, yeah, I'm cool. probably going to do the black suits and I think my promo thing is going to be like a three-eye ski mask, you know, right, sorry. things like that. Right, right, right. right. But it's just, hey... We're rolling with that. Like I have an album release coming up, and I, we're gonna wear all black. I got black food, you know. It's cool. Be- yeah, I dig that. So it's interesting too, just even thinking really quickly. I was just thinking of Souls of Mischief and the in the in the um, transition from that from the debut to uh, to No Man's Land, mm-hmm. which is a really kind of an, an interesting thing because I think it also 
it's going back to Oakland and this whole area too. It sort of shows a transition of that period of time too, really from like the early nineties to the to the mid nineties. And high sc- high school to grown. Yeah. You know, seeing fools fall off, seeing fools decide to sell dope or be killers and all that kind of stuff and when we don't have this unifying air, a four star on thing of having to go to school every day, yeah, and watching fools make their choices and go into that thing, like right. when we were talking about no man's land. We were talking about Oakland, like we called the okay. land, so it was like no man's land, you know. And so it, I think that is an accurate description. It was a transition. I, I mean, I think history has been good to that record. I to think no during the time period, it was it was seen as such a departure. It was maybe a little misunderstood by the press because if yeah. you didn't really live here too, maybe you, didn't you missed know, a little yeah. bit. Of You're like the, these guys are about sun and right. happiness, and now they're talking about not sun and not happiness. I'm like, you look at our listen to our first album. It's like living let live is about shooting people who mess with us. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, I mean, half that stuff is like like tell, tell me who profits. profits. Yeah. Uh, what was the other one? Anything can happen. Oh, those yeah. are all like. Serious gang stories. Yeah, the and things themes like are that. intact. I'm yeah. staying intact. And in fact, No Man's Land probably has more freestyle, just rap rap, right. than the first record. It's more the beat style and everything. But press, man, <laughs> no, you know I mean, what I'm saying? Though they yeah. they have no idea what they're talking about, right? Ever, right, right. now. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Right, now. right now. Well, yeah, there's no level of for qualifications right now, right? Yeah, yeah. So, there's no quality. There's no metric. Yeah, yeah, right metric. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, but so I don't ever, ever worry about that and that's why I say history is kind of since we made that departure it kind of became understood that we're not going to be closed into these boxes we're going to be flipping things differently and I think hieroglyphics has made a good living off of that like every one of our projects is different I don't think any are missteps you know so in the long term I think that you know when you look back like at a Ramsey Lewis or Mm -hmm. George Clinton or anything like that you're like oh this shit is great so I'm happy that that departure was made and I think I'm happy that Oakland is the, the soundscape like first of all we never left none of us you know right like I think Dell lives in Richmond but that's not really you yeah, know it's we've never, still basically yeah, and he's still around here but um, I'm glad that it's been sort of a dynamic place too so it's allowed yeah, our, sure. our musical dynamism that to, to to be a sort of a tradition that we create yeah I mean it's obviously informed the music the whole constantly right yeah I mean even the beat style in No Man's Land is more like Okay, we're in high school. We're listening to these jazzy things because right. we're Walkman, right? Sure. Now I got a car because I'm a rapper uh-huh. and I got 16s in it and all this kind of stuff. I want to hear something with some bump. Yeah. You know, so we're driving around right. slapping something, you know? Right, right, right. Then the next record trilogy, it's like, okay, we're a little older. We've been through it. We're indie. Yeah. This is These are the things that we're... we're yeah, into. the samples are maybe... It's a little more sophisticated in a way. It's more mm-hmm. cosmic. You guys are kind of... Yeah, you're evolving because that's the thing too. Is it, I was kind of thinking about this as well, and sort of thinking almost about Prodigy a little bit in regards mm-hmm. to this because um, there's I think there's few groups that that start out on a commercial level in hip hop at a young age that mm-hmm. can actually keep things going in a totally respectable and successful progressive way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Mob Deep obviously is yeah. one of them. But yeah. you guys were you guys were basically the same age. No, as we were even up. we were, yeah yep. Like, as far yeah, as like, Prodigy, what, he was 42, he was going to be 43 this year, so we're the same age, right? Yeah, and coming out with records around the same. But we never came out, I think, Mob Deep, uh, Peer Pressure was the yeah. youngest song they made. Definitely. Everything else was grown grown man music, you know, right, right. even on that first album. And yeah. I think that's the same with us. Like, we had, you know, we had these things that sort of are teen issues, mm-hmm. first record, but then after that, it's like we've been grown and, and we live in life, you know, we've been on our own. So, I think that... Um, We've been allowed to progress as grown people rather than them trying to keep us young. Because Jive wanted to keep us young for, because kid groups make a lot of money and you can sure. show them up and spit them out. But and if you look at Jive in later years, I mean, that's what it is. sync, Bass Street Boys. Yeah, all that stuff. Britney. Yeah, all that shit. Well, that was a big change for... That's kind of part of the reason why you hieroglyphics even went. Oh, no, we got dropped, though, because they, because they were going to go in yeah. that direction. They yeah. wanted us to make... They wanted us to remake a song from our demo, the Cab Fair song, for yeah. our second album. And we resisted them on that, but they had they had their sights set higher. And I'm pretty sure. I mean, Jive is defunct, so I'm pretty sure them guys are all sitting fat somewhere and they cashed out. Oh, I don't doubt it. Yeah, but but they're also defunct. We yeah. still exist. You know? Yeah, so, exactly. I, so what's like? So as far as like in currently, because um, for hieroglyphics, I'm curious, like what, how the you know how you guys keep the chemistry going as far as a business too, because there's it, it's evolved too. You have like the 
the festival kind of mm-hmm. jump off now every it's like around Labor Day or yeah September. so nine three ninety three right September oh, nice. third so okay. then it's so, so Labor Day right was now. on nine three the first year we did it mm-hmm. and then so now we just do it on Labor Day because it's like yeah. day party sure last party of the summer tradition kind of thing how does that how do you build that out it's like it's, it's obviously a big group of guys so you have to sort of agree on a lot of stuff right like, well we have a central committee right. and then everybody's input is respected so when you look at how it's curated. It, you'll see this, like, oh, this guy brought this and this guy mm-hmm. brought that. But we try to treat it just like a music festival and and stay fans. And, I mean, Tim House has been really good in, in right. sort of staying connected to, to the younger stuff. Right. So, but we want to we wanted say, hey, well, what what fest, what is missing? And it's kind of like, I think Rock the Bells provided that to a large extent. Sure. And it's gone now. So right. we're kind of slipped into that position, mm-hmm. but with a sort of a bass slant. You know, like last year we had Short and Juvie there. Right. Like I don't think you would see them at a Rock the Bells necessarily. Maybe no. toward in the later years, but, right, but, right. but but for us, that's like definitely like hell yeah. And that's not something we worry about violence or anything. Going that's all you know. Short and Juvia is party music. You know they're both oh, sure. fun fun rappers. Right, right. You know so we we just try to curate something where it's like what festival would you want to go to? And now that festivals have become like the new way. I mean it's, they're just concerts. Oh, like yeah. we, but, but there was no concerts for so long because of violence and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You had to mix it up. Mm-hmm. But now it's sort of moved to this festival thing. And we're trying to do something that uh, is different from all these other sort of, I don't want to say generic in a negative way. Well, I guess it is. But yeah. it's like you have people who you can tell are not connected to the culture. Maybe just doing a lineup of their favorite bands. And I think right. the difference between that and the High Road Day is you can see the connection to the culture and, and the... Uh, the thread going throughout, yeah, the and I mean indie millions. culture, underground culture, right. local culture, right, right. foodie culture, all that. Like yeah. we don't just have a, a hot dog, corn dog vendors, right, and, right. and and big churros and things like that. Yeah, like we have local style, fools right. who are from here who are dope food trucks. You know, yeah. we have local businessmen. The even the 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 stuff that we're giving away is all you know. It's like a local thing. Then we, I mean, you know, we had like Anderson Pack. Uh, and knowledge before before they really bubbled. Mm-hmm. We had Kehlani, you know, um, Saba, you know, like all yeah, these people dope. where it's like, it's not like we're trying to catch them before they bubble. We're just right. like, this shit is dope. Somebody's got to check this out. And then when people finally do check it out, they're like, whoa, this shit is really yeah. dope. And that's kind of where we're trying to keep going, man. Because in the East Bay, there's not, like, obviously there's stuff over in San Francisco, outside lands and Treasure Island and these kind of longstanding kind of more corporatized uh, type of big 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 tent type Stern of events. Grove. Right? Yeah. Um, but in the East Bay, I mean, there's there's not a lot of multi, like, artists. Uh, it's starting, though. It's starting. Right. And I think that has to do with the demographic shift, too. Sure. Nobody has $100 for a, a, a party or $200 for a party. Oh, seriously? Or, or the internet access. Now that it's in the phone, yeah, but before the internet access to get the ticket the day it came out. So, mm-hmm. you know, outside lands, all that stuff be sold out before the average Joe. Yeah, can even you know sure, he's sure. not sitting at his tech job with a pop up that says yo outside lands tickets are open. Yeah, like, but that's changing with the phones because right. now you know with uh, bands in town and all these things, if you have Instagram or Twitter, you have that you can get that too. Yeah. So it's changing a little bit. Right. But we are sort of we were kind of on the vanguard. They had Art and Soul. Oh right right. Um, now they have that thing. Uh, they got a couple things. One in Alameda. But, I mean, you look at the lineup, I'm like, that ain't what we're trying to do. Sure. Right? And then they have um, Bay Area Vibes, which is like reggae-centric with, with um, then they had Nas there and like Bass Nectar and stuff. Right, which is also a different lane. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad that they're, sure. they're at least respecting the diversity of listeners. Right, right. We're just trying to get a cool festival, affordable, that, that people out here will be proud to go to. And even if you're not into music, you'll be exposed to new music, but you got food, you got jumpers for the kids. Right, right. So it's really a, it started as a block party. Right. And that's, we're trying to keep that vibe mm-hmm. with, 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 while expanding and increasing the, the value. Of right. It. Well, speaking of phones, too, I just, I, I was curious about this, too, if you feel like talking about it or not, but I know that, and we mentioned this, of course, like in a few minutes ago when we were just talking, but like I noticed a while ago when you, you totally pulled out completely of social media and stuff, mm-hmm. which, no, no matter who it is, whether it's like an artist or just a regular human being that isn't uh, in that uh, arena, it's always fascinating and liberating. You kind of like, I'm excited to see someone get off of that. Mm-hmm. And, and cause you can, doesn't mean that you're getting, you know, out of life in any no, way. No, you're getting more into life. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering like when you did that, like, like I thought it was a cool, it was obviously a respectable move, but 
what how did I mean it's kind of a trip to even ask like how that what that was like because it's such a social norm now too but it's it's hard because I have products to promote yeah but beyond like that now that my social media is the Rap Noir Project Rap Noir Project Hibiscus Garden Hotel which is a new hotel I got down in uh, Panama and um, Pro Intel Company which is like my design firm not necessarily architectural design but clothes graphic design mm -hmm. all that stuff and so I'm trying to just keep my stuff keep it professional right on, on there you know and um, if I if, if it becomes something that's absolutely necessary I'll probably just get an intern to right, run it right. and then have them be well versed in my philosophy and concepts but right. have them run it but uh, I use so I'll, I'll still lurk because mm -hmm. you know if I want to find out who died or what 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 um how can I get some cheap tickets to outside lands or, right. who, you know, who won the game? It's useful from that perspective. Sure. So, you know, I follow that. And there's eye candy on there. I mean, I'm a male. Right. There's, right, there's right, eye candy right. on there. There's good true, stuff to look at. True, true, food, true. food, porn. Yeah. Design porn, you know, like yeah, all that, that kind stuff. of stuff. Yeah. So I see its utility, but as far as interaction, I'm not big on interaction. Right. Like it, it, what they say, you're never supposed to meet your heroes. Like, mm -hmm. and then, I, I mean, this, I don't want to go racial with it, but like, I'm a 42-year-old black man from Oakland who survived the Reagan era and mm -hmm. the Bush era and the Obama era, living the Trump era. My mentality is probably very different than the majority of my fans who are probably half my age right. and from different uh, ethnic and cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. So it was, I found myself getting in arguments over shit. I'm like, you're a fucking straight. You love my music. I mean, I mean, we got... Fans are racist and stuff. You know, like, they like our music. They don't like, like me as a human being or right, right, right. my folks or, you know, hip-hop even. It's like <laughs> our music. And I would find myself getting into interactions with them that weren't always positive. Right. And I'm like, this is taking money out of my children's mouth. Mm -hmm. I, don't want, I don't want people to be walk away from, like, oh, that guy's an asshole. I like his music, but I, I, he's an asshole. Right, you know, right, I'd rather right, just right. be like, like the music. Let you know the music is here. It exists. You know, and you can purchase it here through right. this link. But social media, you look at now, like I've got a 20-year-old or, you know, in that age group and all that kind of stuff, they view themselves through that lens. So if you look at the makeup style, fools are walking around like it's a Broadway play or something. <laughs> you know, like they're made up like drag queens and right. stuff. Uh, you look at the clothing style. It's all a look. It's not even like I like this stuff. It's like, oh, this is a look. Right, right, this right. is a fly look. So I don't even want to, I'm more from the, I can a digital immigrant. They're kind of digital natives, mm -hmm. and I'm more from the reality is the reality, and that's not, and they really aren't from that. A lot of people, even people who are immigrants, digital immigrants, are not even like that sometimes. Yeah. When, you think, when you add in Facebook, right. and everybody's right. fronting, and I'm, I don't care about it. Like, reality is way, way more important than what's going on, and Absolutely. I don't need other people to know what's going on. And I mean, like, you tell your movements, your house get burglarized in Oakland, it's that small. Like, yeah. oh, these fools on tour. Right, I'm right. going up in there, you know, right, like right, so. Right. It's 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 been an overall net negative right. for for me. Social media, well, in I think general. in general for for, for humanity. Yeah, no question. But yeah. definitely for me. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, it'll be like somebody posts a picture of me in Dallas. My I get a call from my alarm that night. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like damn. You know, to where I have to have a house sitter right, whenever right. I leave now. Right. You right. know, and just things like That's that because people know where you are. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, it's been an overall net negative for me. It's gonna be a no for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to. Before we kind of wrap up, I, I, I'm fascinated by that hotel. Would you want to be down to talk about the hotel a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So, what is that exactly? So it's a 19 rooms. I got a uh, beach. Got horses. It's in a, a, a Santa Catalina, mm -hmm. uh, Panama, right outside of Santa Catalina. Nice. I've never been to Panama. So I... Panama just kind of opened up for tourism maybe the past 10, 15 years. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, like Panama is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the roads are nicer than they are here. They got this canal. They finally got the money, the canal back after being used for it right, for right. a century. Yeah. So now that they have it back, there's more money being pumped into the country. So there's a lot of infrastructure programs going on. No shanty towns. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might see something that looks to you from your Western view like it's a shanty town, but of course, it's yeah. for somebody living on their land that with the house they built, and mm -hmm. they're not begging outside. That, right you on. know, they're taken care of. But um, got deep sea fishing, snorkeling, scuba diving. Probably the best wave in Central America. Really? Um, 
yoga, a lot of crafty stuff, uh, hiking. Mm-hmm. And uh, so basically, I, I went to this place. And I loved it so much. And I was talking to the guy, and he was like, well, I'm the owner. If you want to buy it, I'll sell it to you. And so he, oh. he sold it. And um, they moved back to Germany. And so I've got uh, a buddy from up north out there running it right now. And she's, like, on it, you know. Nice. We're improving the menu, adding on everything, making sure mm. the cleanliness level is bumped up. Because it's very it's rustic. I mean, you're gonna, it's going to be a dragonfly or a gecko right. in your room at some point. You know, right, like, right, it's, right. Not, it's not... Uh, even the Radisson or anything or the Trump Towers or anything. So but it's yeah, good it's for, still, like we got rooms for $20 all the way up to 100 bucks. Oh, So it's good okay. for backpackers and okay. we got villas for families and things like that. So it's a, uh, it's called Hibiscus Garden, hibiscusgarden.com and it's something where I think that I'm moving towards with my design stuff, mm-hmm. doing more designs in those types of areas. Not trying to overdevelop it but like doing sort of these bed and breakfasts or just cool houses that are mm-hmm. environmentally friendly mm-hmm. and sort of are in tune with the local environment. Because that's the good thing about design is I can do it anywhere from anywhere. Right? Sure. As long as I have the local conditions, mm-hmm. I can put things together. And I think in the end, my practice is going to be probably that. And then I'm really into fashion, so I think I want to do like some gear and maybe make that my base of operations. Because the thing I think people don't, get, yeah, people don't get about Panama is everything comes through Panama. Okay. So what it's not more, like if you're on an island... Yeah. Milk is expensive, right? Absolutely. Uh, bottled yeah. water is expensive. Mm-hmm. Panama, everything we have here, this probably came through Panama. Mm. You know, like everything. So flat screen costs the same or if not less than everything. Right, then right. we live in a post-UPS, post-FedEx, post-Amazon, post-Google world. So if it's some, you know, secret uh, capsule supreme jacket that goes on sale... Right. I can get it and get it sent to me in the middle of the jungle in Panama. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what's the, it, there's no, the first world, third world thing is blurred by the fact that you can have all these th- first world amenities delivered to you in the third world. Right, right. Because, right. shit, all the fulfillment is down there anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, yeah. so it, it kind of changed my mentality. Before I would be like, oh, I've got to live in the States, etc. Now I can't see myself living here much longer. Really? Nah. You know, I'm, I mean, my daughter's in immersion Spanish. Um, t- this I, I'm 42. I'm not gonna live with another 42 here. Like when they talk about all oh, these brothers dying so young of heart attacks and shit like that, you think that's just our diet? Like the dudes that are dying, they have good, like these dudes have good diet. They got tr- personal trainers it's and nutritionists. Right. It's literally the environment we grew up and how tough it is. And I'm not uh, totally. It's great. It's the most opportunity. I'm not. I'm not a just hate everything American. This is where I'm from. Right. I, I can't possibly you know. But on the same token, it's rough on all people. Absolutely. Being a brother in America is tough because there's no solace. I'm going to get my head knocked off in my hood. And if I venture outside of my hood, I'm going to get my head knocked off either by a resident who's like, what are you doing over here? Or by the cops. Mm. So where's the solace? Where, like just my house. And even my house, you got guys trying to jump through the windows. You know, I got barbed wire and dogs and cameras. Right. And I just live in regular East Oakland. Right, right, you know, right. and, and 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 it's not because I'm Austin. I mean, I drive a Tacoma. Like it's not because I'm ostentatious. Yeah, it's because sure. the hood is full of sharks. Right, right. You know, so there's no solace or solace, mm. whatever. You know, it's yeah, just like yeah, you yeah. can't you can't escape this sort of thing. The saying, "Die, die, die," or I'm gonna kill you. Hurry up. <laughs> yeah. And so yes, a lot of man. us die. Yeah. You know, and I, and I don't think I think that's more a um, when you look at the numbers, it's probably more of a class thing. Like I don't, I don't think I don't think that. Poor people of any color are living a long time, right? You know, no. But I, but I but think that I'm most exposed to in my, you know, I mean, brothers got ulcers. I'm saying I got homies with ulcers. They've had ulcers since they were 17. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. what I'm saying bald patches, right? You know, from from stress, just stress related alopecia and all that kind of sure, stuff sure. since they were youngsters. Like that was a high school thing right. or early 20s thing. Right. And now some of them dudes have lost their minds, so they're homeless. They're on the street. I mean, I'm seeing them like four teeth later. Right. You know, so I can't, I can't see it. And I want to, I want my, I got a five year old. I hope to have more children, but I don't want them growing up with this level of knowledge of stuff that I have. It's, it's overwhelming. And Absolutely. I, and, and I, I think knowledge is great, but it's got to be tempered with some hope mm-hmm. or else you're just going to defuse. I mean, them telling you, you're not going to live past 21 or 24 makes it so you make decisions like get a face tattoo. You know what I'm saying though? Or, or, uh, you know, get a felony. 
for sure. some short money. Sure. Because you're like, well, shit, I'm going to be dead or in jail anyways. Yeah, it's kind of a fatalistic kind of choice sometimes. It, I mean, and I, I think mainstream does not, I think they think, we got this false sense of intelligence in the world. Mm -hmm. Where people think that people in the hood are dumb. Mm -hmm. Just like people think people who talk with a southern accent are slow. Right. Even though, like, that's crazy. That's insane. Yes. It's an accent. Right. It's crazy. Right. Right? Maybe even Mississippi, but no, I'm just hmm. it's just crazy, right? Of course. Of course. Of course it is. It, it, so, so I think that the mainstream thinks, oh, these dumb hood nogs, these dumb hood boogers, they just do all this stupid stuff. They, you know, they're idiots. And it's like, nah, somebody was like, yo, I'm not going to not eat tomorrow. <laughs> and you know what if I if I you know if I just do this my mom might have to work less. you know like they're making real mm -hmm. conscious decisions oh yeah and they know the we know the consequences we visiting our daddies in prison and we you know are they dead or the homies is locked up for life but they make these decisions because of that sort of fatalistic uh view which oftentimes is put in our head like life ain't short life is long yeah you know but we don't think like that and i'm and yeah. i'm not trying to speak for the mentality of everybody in the hood or everybody that's broke but i've seen it where cats defuse their own selves early on and now they're my age and they they got a, a felony jacket they you know they they unhirable because they didn't put anything inside of their brain right. etc and that's that's just a rough existence it's mm. a rough existence but i don't think it's just because people are dumb or uneducated a lot of times it's like, well, I'm in a capitalist system. That means I need to get to the capital quickest. What has the highest ROI? <laughs> and what do I have access to with the highest ROI? How can I distribute this as wide and far as possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at a Jay-Z who, who had the opportunities, who created the opportunities. I don't want to be like, that dude wasn't lucky. He's smart. Right. right? He's, and dope at what he does. Sure. And then not only that, like, everybody knows a rapper's better than Jay-Z. So it's not a skill or talent level. It's mm -hmm. what do you do with your money and who do you surround yourself with yes. and how do you put, you know, mm -hmm. you look at LeBron. He put all his homies through college so they could run his businesses. Mm -hmm. Have you seen him with a DUI? Have you seen him mm -hmm. caught naked snorting hella powder with strippers or any of that kind yeah. of stuff? No, but that's because he's a smart person or he's not smart enough to know he's not the smartest guy and needs to get people around him. Same with Jay-Z. Like, mm -hmm. you can't make half a Billy rapping. No, not at all. Period. Yeah. No, nobody can. It's not possible. There's not enough people who are going to buy music, even when music was something people bought. Yeah. Like he has more money than all the than everybody for a reason. Right. It's because he was smart with with state property, with 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 Rockaware, with probably all his other investments. I mean, he turned yeah. title. What he put ten million in and yeah. got one hundred fifty back. Like and that's Rock how much. Keeps expanding. To, yeah, to yeah. everything. Right. Right. But I mean, so. These aren't dumb individuals who are just lost and don't know any better. Right. A lot of times they do know better and they make a conscious decision. And in a place that's more about surveillance now and snitching and informants and, right. and show, snitching on yourself on public, public you know, social media and stuff, there's going to be more and more guys going down. Mm. So it might be smart to invest in something else and, and, and work in something else. And, and for me, it's just been... Um, you know, putting out other mu musicians, but that's right. not the most viable. But also um, investing in real estate, investing in myself, up upgrading my mental tools so of that course. I have a skill that is universal and can be used worldwide. And investing in my kids and their and their education and, and their experiences because that's really what's important. Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, I, one. Uh, it's, I love sitting and talking to you because I've always thought I've always admired your mind when it comes to the to the game, especially uh, well, first with hip hop. Because we, you know, we've we've done some shows together, and mm -hmm. we were in Europe um, out for for a run one time. Mm -hmm. And um, you're always the guy that first one up, and oh, oh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, and, and working and working before you know working on another sub before we have to get on the bus, and, and working after the show, and mm -hmm. like uh, just always. Um, uh, a great conversation. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you. So, I appreciate your time and just oh, thank, thank you, you for man. doing it. I'm and glad you're still bringing the culture, man. Like a lot of cats, I think they there's they have opportunities. They got a podcast, this, that, and the third. But like you said, the the metric or the prerequisites, they don't have the pedigree. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad, like, to see you still, like, oh, I'm really nah. I've been right. pushing this for a long time, putting out dope music. You know, what I'm saying, right. finding, finding underground stuff and bringing right. it to the forefront. 
So it's good to see you still doing it, man. Yeah, for sure. Because it's tough. I know it's tough. It is tough. Is it it tough? I don't know. Yeah, it's tough. Well, this I love to do because it's it's a hobby right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not like no one owns it. That's the same rap with me, man. Yeah, for sure. Same rap with me. So you can have, you can actually truly enjoy it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'd like to get it. Sure, I'd love to expand it and and uh, I'd love to be able to make it a job where I'm paid, but then that would maybe alter how I have to do this too. Um, But yeah, but to be able to like, you know, travel and, 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 and even be able to just sit with you for a little bit and, and talk about your career and, and your thoughts and stuff. It's, that's the value for me is just getting a moment of someone's to he- listen to someone chat. And I know that by me relaying it to people, there's a lot of folks that otherwise that have been fans of, of souls and mischief of your work in one period or another that probably don't know all this other stuff that mm-hmm. don't, that aren't privy to the conversation we might have backstage or, um, traveling to a gig or when you meet someone for an actual business meeting or something like that. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's dope. So thanks again, man. No, man, thank you. Good looking. Yeah. All right. Much thanks to my man Tajay in the place, recorded in Oakland, the house list. Thank you guys so much for listening. If this was your first time listening, please subscribe on iTunes, subscribe on SoundCloud. Shout out to the people that listen on SoundCloud. Let's keep reposting this and make the most of that outlet while it's around so thank you let's get it out there spread the word if you're a fan of hieroglyphic souls of mishif tajay please spread the word to your friends and family uh check out that rap noir project on itunes tajay and the producer unjust some cool stuff we're going to get into the flip of that two song single i'm gonna play a little snippet of watch out in just a second listen i also am working on a project too that i wanted to plug real quick before the end of the show obviously um, you know, connected to Souls and Mischief, the one and only producer, iconic, genre-defining Prince Paul, who, you know, as you know, did a whole record with uh, Souls and Mischief a few years back. Me and him have an album coming out in September called It's True Mental. I originally released it in 2005 on my label, Female Fun Records. Some of y'all might remember that label from my projects with MF Doom, DJ Spinna, J. Rawls, Geology, Sadat X, on and on. And uh, Prince Paul and I have a record coming out. The pre-order is available right now. So I wanted to get a plug-in for that. Uh, It's just a limited vinyl and cassette. And with that vinyl, you get a special free download of a a whole other project from Prince Paul called Redux. So it's really two albums. but So cop that pre-order. I only made 500 copies of this record. I'm not going to do another repress. It was just something cool to do. There's a tour to follow in in September. Prince Paul instrumental female fun it's available pre-order at redline uh music distribution at big cartel so find that and get that pre-order before it sells out thank you guys so much for tuning in much shout out to tajay hieroglyphics and the whole souls of mischief the east bay and thank you guys so much for listening i'm going to keep these going for y'all only on the house list my name is Peter Agassin. Every episode is produced and engineered by the one and only CJ Stewart. Thanks again, and I will catch you guys next time. Watch out! Manny and Mo made millions. Mo was about his money. Manny was more about chilling. Mo sipping, boat tipping, and leaning. Big tricking, be hit whipping, and gleaming. Mo was different. He had vision. His first ticket, rinsed it. Spent his on legit shit. That's the business. The game isn't. And Manny played it to the fringes. Money to blow, blow to money, same sentence. And if his digits Get thin, just kick a nigga dough off the hinges. He liked to call Mo stingy. Said he was scared to get dingy, cause his legal ventures now occupied his attention. Knowing damn well they was both getting it written. Same spot, same pots whipping them chickens. Split every last cent in the center, but now all of a sudden he having problems with retention. That's kid shit, but add envy to the mix with some good cheers, some chips, and there goes the friendship. Man, he couldn't stand his man ascension. Now we plotting, writing schemes to have him twisted. So when them pigs hit, Mo knew in an instant somebody had ratted the product was planted. Only cat that had access was Manny. Told on him, and now Manny getting Mo money. Watch Jerry out. and Toy, they was twins. Now they looked alike, but really they was just friends. Like the tag team when they went to bust tricks. Didn't need the money, they would do it just for kicks. Shits and giggles, and cats are spin to be in the middle of two smooth skinned teenage twins getting it in from the migrant workers to the preacher man. Had them all singing Hey 19, like Steely Dan. When I say preacher man, boy, I'm dead ass. One would trick big cash to hit that ass. Evangelical type, like the throat fits.